Hello and welcome to the 11th session of the uh, uh, RQI online 2020-20. Uh, oh, actually the 12th session. Welcome to the 12th session of the uh, RQI online 2020-2021. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Robert Johnson. Robert, can you please share screen? Yeah. All right. So it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Robert Johnson, uh, who is going to talk about uh, communication through uh, quantum fields near a black hole. Robert, whenever you want, the uh, floor is yours. Oops, sorry. No. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Eduardo, and thank you, well, Eduardo Thales, and all other organizers that I in the background um, for the invitation to, to um, present this paper here today. Um, well, it's called, I, you see all of my screen, right? I have. Um, yeah, everything's everything. Okay. I did, no, well, I have something in the way here, but. It, should work like this, sorry. So, Communication Through Quantum Fields Near a Black Hole is the title of this paper, which we uh, published last year, together with Eduardo and Achim, who you uh, all would know probably if you're attending this conference, and David Arukita and Mark Casals, which if you don't know them yet, I hope you will know more about after this talk. Um, so this was a project that went on pretty long, I think, uh, from the first discussions to putting out the paper it was at least five years. Uh, so you may wonder what kept us going that long. Um, although, I mean, it was, uh, as a return, we got out these nice colorful pictures, which I hope to share with you today. Well, I think what kept us going was a pretty exciting question, um, which you could put like this, when Alice falls into a black hole, how much will Bob hear from her? And well, when Alice falls into a black hole, sort of was one of the starting questions, I guess, for, for this field of relativistic quantum information. And then to me, this was particularly exciting because in my PhD, I was studying signaling and communication between particle detectors. And of course, the goal there was to understand how uh, in a curved space-time, space-time curvature will impact communication between particle detectors. So how the curvature of space-time will impact the propagation of information in a massless quantum field. And um, the first thing one probably thinks about when it thinks that the space-time curvature's impact on um, space-time, uh, on information propagation would of course be the gravitational redshift. Like, right, if Bob sits close to a black hole, he would get redshifted. He, um, that should impact his ability to process the information Alice sends to him. But close to a black hole, there's actually more um, than that going on, which has to do with how signals propagate in a massless quantum field when it sits or lives on a curved space-time. So when we hear massless fields, we probably think, well, the first thing we think about as well, in a massless field, um, information propagates in a, along light rays, right? And that's what happens around Minkowski space-time. Alice sends a signal. Bob will have to catch these light rays. Um, if he doesn't, if he lets them pass before he switches on his uh, receiver, well, he will hear nothing from Alice. We know that that's different in a curved space-time because in general, on curved space-times, Hirschen's principle doesn't hold. So um, if Alice was to send out a signal at this point, apart from the direct null geodesic that is propagating out of the light cone, um, the, um, a signal also travels slower than that at um, like a long time like geodesics. That has to do with the fact that the retarded range function, which is here the mathematical object, which tells us everything about signal propagation, at least in the classical field, um, is singular on the light cone. That's what we all know about. But more than that, it has a tail term, which is non-vanishing inside the light cone, inside the light cone. That happens even in flat space times of different dimensions. It happens in expanding universes. And that was, of course, um, of course, studied over the last years. You can use these tail terms to transmit information without transmitting energy along. Or Eduardo and collaborators looked at um, the, F, um, the impact of that in cosmologically expanding in expanding universes, um, so in cosmological scenario. Now, around a black hole, there's even more interesting happening than just the tail term, which is that um, around a black hole, there are several null geodesics along which you can send information from Alice to Bob. 
right? I mean, if you look here in this sort of my artist's impression of what's going on, if you have Alice sitting here at the red dot and um, Bob at the blue dot, so static positions in Schwarzschild space time close to this black hole, then of course the shortest way for the signal to travel from Alice to Bob is the direct null geodesic. But some time after that null geodesic has passed by Bob, um, another null geodesic will hit Bob from the other side. That's a null geodesic which is orbiting the black hole once before it connects Alice to Bob. And you get the gist of it after the secondary null geodesic, there's a tertiary one and a quaternary one and so on. Um, so there are many uh, null geodesics connecting Alice to Bob along which you can send information from Alice to Bob. So our goal here was then to study this and to understand how um, all these different paths that information can take from Alice to Bob, how they combine together and what combined signal strength or combined channel capacity they would allow for. So um, to present you um, that to you today, I was thinking basically, basically split it up in three parts. Of course, I'll start out with uh, um, with a review, a brief overview about signaling between particle detectors. How do we set the whole thing up? I guess it's what we will be seeing, what we will be seeing in, in many talks this afternoon or this session. Um, there we'll see that um, if you want to understand the leading order signal, we actually have to look at the classical retarded green function, even when we consider quantum detectors and quantum fields. The leading order signal is car carried by the classical retarded green function. And so um, we'll talk about that and see how this can be calculated up to on a large enough region to cover all these interesting effects that we are um, headed at. And then a third part, I would present to you the uh, signaling scenarios that we looked at and that then should explain what's going on in these colorful pictures. So signaling with particle detectors. How do we model and Alice and Bob as local observers? Well, I've said it already. Um, in modeling the signaling scenario, what we do is we let Alice and Bob use unrelated particle detectors as they are sending and receiving devices. So this is the standard, uh, the standard Hamiltonian, right? Um, Alice and Bob both have a detector which is interacting with the field amplitude operator of a massless scalar Klein Gordon field along the classically prescribed world line. This field operator couples to the monopole operator of the two level system, which is the quantum detector. So it drives transitions from the excited to the ground and the ground to excited state. And the strength of this coupling is controlled here in front, where lambda is a, 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 real, a small real value constant and eta um, notates, is the notation for the switching function. So this function takes values between zero and one and is there to control the timing of the company. And here, directly a comment for the experts, what we will use here are just sharp switching functions. We do get away with that because we're looking at the signaling terms in, in, in the perturbation theory later on. So we actually get away with using sharp switching functions and a point like detector, which is a well, very convenient place to be at compared with other calculations. And then what is the, um, I mean, how does the signaling work itself or how? Robert, I'm sorry, you muted. Wait, you muted yourself, I think. Hmm, yeah. Can you hear me now again? Yeah, I was saying. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I was starting to talk about how we modeled the communication from Alice to Bob. So the idea is that um, Bob and Alice and the quantum field, they start out in a product state. Bob, since he's waiting for a message, just prepares its, ground, its detector in its ground state. And Alice has, of course, the choice to prepare any state, qubit state she wanted into her detector. And of course, she would encode the message that she wants to send to Bob in the choice of state here. So for example, she could you know, choose between two different states encoding zero or one, so the values of a random bit given to her. And then the question is, how does her choice of initial state impact Bob's final state after the interaction has taken place? So for this, we use the Dyson series to um, approximate or perturbatively expand the time evolution operator. And then if we look at Bob's final state, which we do by during time evolution, tracing out Alice in the fields, we get Bob's final state here in the perturbative, uh, perturbation expansion. We look for Alice's impact in this final state. 
what do we see? Well, Bob started out in the ground state, so mostly he's still there. Then comes a term, which is a local noise term. It really doesn't depend, as you can see here, on Alice being there or not, but it's only the noise, I mean, the change, the, the impact that the field locally has on Bob's detector, so it may get it excited with some uh, pr uh, probability. And in here, that's the leading, oh, I put this wrong, see? The leading order contribution should only start here. That's a contribution which has to do with both Alice and Bob, as we can tell. And it gives off diagonal element to Bob's final state. As it's, and this is so, yeah, this is the leading order signaling contribution. Ah, so this is right. This is the leading order contribution, and this is the leading order signal in here. Higher terms then are in, in, they only appear at fourth order in the, in the coupling constant. Now, what do these P2, C2, and D2 look like? Well, P2 is just the, the standard term, the classic term that's probably known to, I mean, to anybody who has looked at the particle detector and the Unruh effect, because that's the excitation probability for a detector. And this one is quantum state dependent, right? This one depends on the quantum state of the field because here what appears is the two-point function of the field. The leading order signal contribution, however, does not depend on the quantum two-point function. It depends on the commutator of the field. So if you look at the C2 uh, integral, then it looks very similar. It's just that now Alice is appearing along the second time integration. And that here, instead of the two point, two quantum two-point function, we have the commutator appearing. And D2 would just look the same as C2. The only thing you have to do is put a minus sign in front and change the sign of omega B up here. Now, this is the reason why also to leading order quantum signaling really behaves, or you can understand by just studying the classical retarded green function, because this commutator, when Bob is in the future like of Alice, is nothing but the retarded green function of the classical retarded green function of the field. And why is this actually then these terms the only one that we are, or that we need to, or that determine the leading order signal strength? Well, that is because if we look at um, the leading order channel capacity, we see that the P2 term actually drops out from there. One way you can see this is you can give Alice and Bob the task to communicate a random bit from A to B. And if you do that, then we see that their success probability to leading order is increased over the guess, just guessing probability by this term, the sum of the absolute values of C2 and D2. Um, and P2, or this local detector noise, would only appear in higher orders. And the same is true also for other measure, measures of channel capacity, like the variable capacity. So this is why we look at this quantity, the sum of the absolute values of C2 and D2, as our measure for the leading order signal strength in the following. Now, we need the green function. Um, and how can this, or what do we know about this, and how do we, how we calculate it? Well, I said in the beginning that um, the green function around the Schwarzschild black hole is characterized by the fact that it has not just one null geodesic in it, but it is also not just, it's not just singular only on the light cone, but even inside the future light cone. And um, yeah, well, so that was that's would be the first thing that I depict here. If we look at the Green's function where X prime would be this red pod point. So the base point where Alice starts the signal off and then X would be a points number in the future light cone. Oh, and G here refers to the retarded Green's function. Then it is singular whenever the two points are connected by null geodesic. And there is a fourfold structure here. The first singularity to leading order, that is, is a Dirac delta. Then the secondary one has a principal value one over sigma. And then come again, a minus delta, a minus principal value, and the whole thing starts over again. So what's interesting here is that, whereas the delta singularity, of course, is sharply uh, localized, you only, you, know, you only see or hear this when you are connected by an array. This principal value already has an effect earlier than that, right? It has a one over sigma um, tail going. So you can hear that secondary light ray or this, yeah, feel the effect, measure the effect of it before the secondary null geodesic arrives. Oh, and sigma here refers to the geodesic distance or so, you know, the singe world function um, between the two points. Um, then right after that first, um, that first, oh, the, the boundary of the light cone, 
begins the um, normal neighborhood around this point, right? So normal neighborhood being the, the region within which, I mean, every two points are connected by unique geodesic. And inside that normal neighborhood, um, we, um, we can express the Green's function in, in the Hadamard form, the so-called Hadamard form, where you see the direct term, um, which has this leading divergency um, multiplied by a bi-scalar u, we agree about this later more. And then this would be the tail, tail term. And uh, the calculation, um, so close to the original point, we base the calculation on, of the green function on this form. Um, we call this region therefore the quasi-local region, which is a subset of the normal neighborhood uh, on which you know, the convergence of the expressions was good enough, good enough, accurate enough for us to use it in the calculations. Far away from that point, sort of if Alice's point lies in the distant past, that's what we call this region of Bob's point, another method has to be used because this one is only valid inside, I mean, at most valid inside the normal neighborhood. So there we use an expansion into multipolar, um, into multipolar modes and um, to, to calculate the Green's function. Then the question or the, the deciding question is how far back in time or how, how far back towards the original signaling point can you get with this function, what you, uh, with this ansatz. What you of course need is that you have a sufficient overlap of these two regions where we use different methods to calculate the Green functions in order to carry out the uh, integration over this term in the, for the C2 and D2 term. So how more specifically did we do this calculation. And you can see that at this slide, which is the only slide where I use animations, I'm trying to get a point across, which in this case is the point that the question isn't even quite well or honestly posed because we, we didn't calculate with the green functions. What happens was that David and Mark did it. So uh, Mark and David, I guess as far as they work together, are based at CBPF in Rio. Mark also spends time of us here at the University College in Dublin. And they uh, are experts on calculating green functions in curved space, space time, in particular on black holes. And they um, were the people doing these calculations with green functions. So the, 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 what comes in the next two slides is nothing but a, a lame, I mean, an, an overview in layman terms. I think uh, Mark was trying to be here today. So he's authorized to interrupt me at any time if I say anything wrong. And he will be there for more specific questions later. Um, I will just give him over a quick overview in layman terms, because that's really the only thing I can. So in the quasi-local region, we have these two terms appearing in the Green's function, which is the direct term, you know, this first carried by this first direct delta, which is the first null geodesic, the one that we probably have the most intuition about. And it's multiplied by this um, bi-scalar u here, here, which is the square root of the so-called von Vleck determinant. This determinant measures whether geodesics focus or defocus um, but yeah, along a geodesic. So it, it tells us something about space-time curvature in that sense. And to solve um, this, what you do is you solve a transport equation along the geodesic connecting x and x prime. Remember, this is still within the normal neighborhood. So here, there's a unique geodesic connecting x and x prime. Then there's the tail term. And uh, the tail term well, for the tail term, there is the, the Hadamard series expression, which holds. So um, this one converges uniformly from on some subset of the maximum neighborhood. But in practice, this ansatz is hard to calculate. So what um, was used here was a multiple power series expansion and the coordinate separation. So T and R are Schwarzschild coordinates. Gamma is the angular separation between those two points. And then there is code available, even the code by Barry Waddle, or put on by Barry Waddle, that was used here to calculate these coefficients and to solve U, uh, and to solve for u. So that was the calculation of the Green's function in the so-called quasi-local region. And then in the distant past, also a series expansion was used. So if you do this um, multipolar decomposition of the Green's function, then or U and V are your light cone coordinates. Um, then you have these coefficients GL here, and they again um, obey partial differential equation, with, which is this one, 
with uh, boundary or initial conditions being minus one half on the boundary of the light cone. And this, um, this partial differential equations was used using a difference, a difference scheme. And if, so that's the first uh, step. They improved it here to a higher order than what was, was used before in the literature. Then of course, we can only, um, numerically you can only deal with a finite number of modes. So they um, calculate this for up to hundred modes where you, when you do the truncation, you need to skillfully smoothen out um, the, the terms. So you introduce a smoothing factor. factor. And when you do that, then you can get to scenarios where you can put Alice, for example, um, at 6m, at a radius of 6m statically, and Bob can move down to 4m. That's as far as you can go so that you still get sufficient overlap between this quasi-local region and the distant past. Because you see this distant past, in principle, it could reach down all the way to the boundary of the light cone. That's what it tries to do. And then what it tries, that's where it tries to also represent this delta singularity from the first primary um, null geodesic. And that grows increasingly different, difficult when Bob moves closer to, to the horizon. So this is why with this, just with this ansatz, don't get down as far as we would like to. But um, Mark and David then implement, implemented a solution, a trick to get around with it, uh, around that, which what had been proposed before in the literature. But I think they, um, this project, he was the first one to use it and um, yeah, to that precision or to that extent, which is that you sort of this initial, this, oops, this divergent term, you express it also in such a in such form of a decomposition. And then you subtract these terms because we will cover them anyway in the in the in our calculation and the, uh, the quasi, quasi local region already. So you, this you can subtract these terms before you do the summation, and that improves the um, the convergence behavior of this ansatz. So with this trick, what Mark and David achieved were, was that we were able to place Bob as close as two point two six. So 0.26m away from the horizon of the black hole and still have sufficient overlap between the quasi-local region and the distant past to do our calculations. So what did we use this for then? What signaling scenarios did we look at? Um, we looked at two different scenarios. One was where sender and receivers sit around its static um, Schwarzschild coordinates and uh, well, Alice sends a signal she is hovering at uh, a radius of 6m, is what we typically used, or what we use in all plots here. And Bob sits somewhat closer to the horizon and um, spends, I mean, depending on scenario, spends also some time coupling to the field and so receiving Alice's signal among, uh, along all these different possible paths. We came up to configurations where Bob would even see the quaternary um, quaternary <clears throat> null geodesic scribing. So what we see here, what we saw there was, yes, the um, wherever the signal is dominated by the direct, the first, uh, the, the, the signal that is carried along the first primary null geodesic, you can clearly see how the, how the time-like contributions, in particular, the higher order null geodesics modulate that signal strength. And maybe a more, um, more unexpected, oops, a more unexpected effect we saw was that um, that the, the in a way you could say that the receiver got transparent to Alice's signals as he moved closer to the horizon. It was harder for Bob to um, detect Alice's signal the closer he was sitting to the horizon. First, that was maybe we thought of that as counterintuitive. Be it maybe hoped for that since Bob sees Alice's signal blue shifted there would be somehow more energy, more strength to the signal, and maybe that could help or improve uh, the signal strength. But actually what is happening here with these detectors is that um, there is a limit on the signal strength imposed by the proper time, the amount of proper time that Bob gets to interact with the signal. So if that time is reduced, also the signal strength goes down. And um, the second, um, the second scenario was then that of where Alice falls into the black hole. So what we'll see there is that Alice 
And Bob, they start hovering at the same point, which is again 6m. This is Tortoise kind of coordinates, other uh, coordinate system. And then as Bob, as Alice falls in on a radial geodesic, she gets to send, I mean, she, she uh, gets to switch on her detector at some point along the geodesic for a fixed amount of her proper time. So the closer in she comes to the horizon, which in these coordinates sits as minus infinity, um, the longer the send out signal appears to be with respect to coordinate times. So let's look at this in more detail, but before maybe you ask, why did we only move around Bob here? Why did we not move around Alice? Well, that can be explained by the fact that we have a certain symmetry in the signals. If you, I mean, if this is the situation that we looked at, Alice sitting here and Bob close to the horizon, then if you sort of time mirror this scenario, you uh, replace, I mean, yeah, you replace the world lines by mirroring them along the x-axis. So x d goes to x d of minus t. And you do the same for the switch chain functions and you interchange the roles. So down here, Bob becomes the sender and Alice the receiver. Now, so or, or let's put it differently. Now the sender sits closer to the horizon and the receiver further out. Um, yeah, so you just, you, you swap, you time mirror, the world lines, and you swap the roles of sender and receiver, then you receive uh, the re this results in exactly the same um, leading order signal strength. The only property you use for that is which holds in static space times um, is this one. So if you switch the points and you interchange the time order, the retarded means function doesn't change, and that is the only property you need to show that your leading order signal strength as measured by this quantity stays, stays the same. So that's our justification for only moving Bob around. <clears throat> and then the results look like this. So in this colorful plot here, you see the scenario where Alice is fixed at a radius of 6m. She has a frequency of one over m. And uh, so this is m is the two m is the Schwarzschild radius here. And see, she switches on her detector for a proper time, amount of proper time of one M. Uh, Robert, what five minutes warning? Yeah, thank you. And then in uh, what is plotted here is the signal strength for different positions of Bob. So we have in, here, in the middle the black hole here, and Bob can sit at, diff at different coordinates. He has a slightly different frequency. He couples his detector for a longer time, for long, a large amount of proper time, 15M. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so that he actually gets to see secondary or higher order null GVs as well. And plotted here then is the resulting leading order signal strength with this, with this color code. So what do we see is going on here? Excuse me. Um, well, we uh, see that the signal strength of course diverges the closer Alice and Bob get. And that's not a surprise that comes directly from the, well, the direct contribution. That's exactly the behavior we know when signaling Minkowski space time. And also here, um, by comparing these two plots, where this one just shows the direct contribution. So this is the signal strength you would observe if the Green's function only consisted of this first um, singular term, the one with uxx prime delta sigma. Um, then you will get this smooth distribution of signal strength for, for the different positions of Bob. And so you can tell that this one is the dominating contribution, but nevertheless, you see that these features here, these ribbles and wiggles, that they uh, are not present in the direct contributions. These are modifications of signal strength arising from the fact that we have, um, we have non-direct contributions. So tail terms and higher order null geodesics. And they would be plotted here. <clears throat> and you can tell, you know, we have annotated here that this is the region where the secondary, I mean, if, if Bob sits in this region, that, and that's where he switches long on, where he, when he has his detector switch long enough, on long enough that he will also see secondary, that we will see secondary null geodesics arriving, right? So the ones that went around the black hole once. And if Bob is located even at larger angular separation, in this case, he even has a chance to catch tertiary null geodesics. 
the plot cuts off here because that's as far as um, we had enough overlap um, in the calculation of the green function. So that's as far as we go with the numerical effort that was put in. Um, what you also see here is that this effect that the closer Bob gets to the horizon, the lower his signal, the, the, the lower the signal strength is that he receives. It's present in the total contribution, but it's also present in the direct contribution already. So why is that? <clears throat> well, we can understand how this comes about, or I mean, for the sake of simplicity here, um, let's look just at the direct contribution, right? Which is when we, in the, in the original expression for C2, we put instead of the green function, the full green function, just this first singular part of, which corresponds to the first null UD6 horizon. This one is easy to evaluate, even analytically. Um, when the detectors are just radius separated. So they have no angular separation. But what you see here is um, that Alice is still, excuse me, I need to, is still placed at six equal to M. And Bob can sit at different radial, uh, <coughs> radial coordinates and couple his detector for three M. Um, Right, what we see here is that, I mean, what one would expect or what one knows from Minkowski space time is that to get a strong signal, you need to tune your detector resonant. Because in the end, you know, this is a delta function, this can be a constant, and then the thing, everything else is positive in the game. So to increase the size of this integral, you want this phase to be constant. And you can achieve this by detuning Bob's detector such that it's in resonance, I mean, accounting for the redshift, that's in resonance with, with the frequency of Alice's signal that comes in. And sure, that gives that allows you to, um, that, um, that is good, that increases your signal, uh, signal strength, but it's not sufficient. You see, the closer you, even if you choose this strategy, right, um, which would correspond to this orange, I mean, the, the green plot here shows if you use identical detectors, so if you don't account for the redshift, then your signal strength goes down much faster. And this is because of the redshift. If you account for the redshift, you're doing better. The green curve, the yellow curve is about the, above the green curve here. So signal strength is increased, but still as you approach the horizon, um, the signal strength goes down. Now, why is that? Well, if you're quick, you're already guessing this from, from the expression here. You can tell that even if you optimize this to one, in the end, the size of this integral is determined by how long, how large the support of this integration is here. But the closer Bob goes to the, come, comes to the horizon, the shorter Alice's signal will look. It will be, I mean, not only blue shift, but also um, decrease. I mean, with respect to its proper time, it will be shorter. So this, the, uh, the size of this integral the, um, the, goes down. And in fact, what you see happening here for um, the direct contribution is general and applies to the full signal. You can tell that whenever Alice has emitted a signal and Bob is restricted to you know, receive it in some region of space time, then no matter what, um, no matter what world uh, line he uses or he flies on, no matter what detector gap he uses and no matter, oh yeah, and no matter what, um, what switching function he uses, um, you will have that you can you know, calculate a constant and the total signal strength will be limited linearly in the amount of proper time that Bob spends interacting with the signal. So if he goes closer to the horizon, this, this interval goes down because the signal is decreased and thus the capacity drops down. And um, I think here it's important to stress that this certainly is because we're coupling the field amplitude. I think this would be different for a detector coupling to the field momentum. Um, now I should speed up because I had my five minute warning. This is just to show you how we identify tertiary and secondary null geodesics. Uh, we did so well by calculating where they would be. So doing careful geometrical, geometrical um, comparisons and by looking at analytical solutions you would have for the principal value distribution. They're very interesting in their own. Um, and well, you can tell that the shapes were exactly those we found in our calculations. And then just a minute, um, biting into my question time, on, of course, on the radio infalling receiver. Um, the interesting part here was, or maybe just once more again, what is the situation? Alice and Bob both start here at 6M, and then Alice falls into the black hole. And somewhere along her world line, she switches on and off her detector so that's just that it interacts for a period of M quarter of her proper time. 
so when she does this early on her geodesic then this um, interval the interval in which bob receives the signal we here chose bob's coupling such that he would only couple to the um, interval where um, the primary and all geodesics arrive with him um, and then in the beginning, this interval is rather short, but if she couples later, it's this, these shaded areas here that correspond to that, then the interval, uh, um, the interval during which Bob receives those signal and during which he will have his detector switched on is much larger. Still, what we see if we plot the, um, if we plot the channel capacity is that the later Alice switches on her detector. So the closer she is to the horizon, the uh, more difficult or the lower the channel capacity is. And that's not so surprising because here we used equal detector gaps in both, uh, both, uh, both detectors. So already from the results we had before, we knew that, well, the further Alice gets in and the more detuned she will be, the lower the channel capacity will be. But what is interesting about this thing is um, shown in the next slide where we have still the old plot, but on the right hand, a separation of the direct and the non-direct contributions to them. So you see <clears throat> that these um, three cases here and the solid lines, you have the direct contribution. So that part of the signal strength, which comes from is carried by primary null geodesics and the dashed lines are the ones which are carried by the non-direct contribution. And um, the closer Alice gets to the horizon when she sends her signal, the more important um, the non-direct contribution gets until it actually takes over their crossing over points example, from this case, close to the horizon, the non-direct contribution is much larger than the direct contribution, uh, con uh, consider that these are logarithmic plots. So what's happening there, we think is probably that whereas no null, secondary null geodesic can make it from Alice to Bob, while uh, um, Bob is interacting with the field, we checked that geometrically, still the arrival of a secondary null geodesic emitted by Alice to Bob is much closer to Bob's switch off when Alice is closer to the horizon. So probably this happens, this increase of the weight of the non-direct contribution because the, null the secondary null geodesics are approaching and they have this one over sigma leading order divergence. So Bob already can sense that. So to summarize, we think that this project shows that when you want to signal close to a black hole, you should take into account certainly the gravitational redshift and the resonance be between the detector, but also higher order null geodesics and the time-like non-null signaling contributions to, um, to your signal. For that purpose, you will need to calculate the classical, the classical retarded green function. And we show that this can be done for a large region, I mean, a region large enough to be interesting, and that is very close to the horizon. And the hope, of course, would be to in the future take this further and to um, use this as groundwork to include genuine quantum properties of the field and quantum information processes, right? For example, look at the quantum channel capacity of um, two detectors interacting with the field. So with this, let me thank you uh, for your attention. Um, and again, the organizers and my collaborators, some of them um, being both at the same time, oh, sorry. Um, for listening to, to, to me today. All right, thank you very much for the great talk, Robert. All right, we opened uh, the question. There was a recipe factor there with uh, the time for your talk, right? <laughs> There's a, uh, let's see, um, uh, question time as usual, please use um, the raise hand feature here on, uh, on Zoom. I don't see any hands. Oh, bro. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. I usually Hello. try to wait if others <laughs> have something first, but I'll go ahead. Yeah, so um, uh, an interesting talk, Robert. I have a couple of things that are, uh, that uh, I guess confuse me. First of all, when you take into account things going around the black hole, um, I mean, intuitively, it seems to me if, 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 I forget who's signaling to who. Let's say Alice is signaling to Bob. He'll get a message, but the one that goes around is the same message and he'll hear it later on. Is, is that right or am I missing something? 
Well, yeah, it should be, right? I mean, we're looking here at how big the impact is that, um, I mean, the combined signal has on, Alice, on Bob's final state, right? So it's just, I mean, so when he tunes on such that he hears the first, the direct part, then that will impact his state. The thing that comes in the middle is not as strong. And then comes the secondary knowledge D6 carries again, you know, an amplitude of the field, which changes Bob's state. And the question is, for example, if this impact of the secondary knowledge D6 will increase or decrease um, the, the effect you see in Bob's detector, right? Because these terms could interfere constructively or destructively, for example. Okay, so, but I guess what I'm thinking, I, I mean, you know, suppose the black hole is, I don't know, a bazillion solar masses and it takes 20 years for a ge geodesic to go around. Uh, I mean, surely he'll get a direct signal and then 20 years later, the indirect, won't he? I yeah, mean, right, I mean, okay, if that was possible and all, sure, you could, I mean, you could uh, either choose to listen to the first signal, you could maybe catch the first signal, do some processing on it, and then decide what to do with the second All right. signal. All right. All right. So he could wait. I okay. I see. That's the idea. If he waited, then he could get the interference. Yes, exactly. Or, we, I mean, okay, we look at different scenarios at intervals which were long to contain all kinds of signals, or even at shorter ones, which maybe compared to what happens when you only catch the primary or only catch the secondary or the ter uh, tertiary now duties. Okay. 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 And and the other thing I wondered. Um, what happens if, like, to what extent does it matter if this is a, a black hole? Like, suppose it's a highly dense object. Couldn't the signal go, you know, be deflected around it by lensing in some way and, and you'll get the same kind of thing? Like, what role does the horizon play that would make it different from a highly dense object? Well, in principle, no, this should be possible, right? I mean, if, uh, well, I have less intuition than you and how, I mean, how this develops, but in principle, yeah, if you, I mean, if you have just a highly dense object, you can still associate it's, I mean, it's both well, Schwarzschild varieties will just be inside it, right? But if everything yeah. takes place outside of whatever this object is, the, the mass should still be the same, but it will probably correspond to operating as much larger radii than the ones that we could be used here. If we put ourselves in quite extreme uh, positions, I guess, the plus that I showed today, and this was sitting at 6m, so three times the Schwarzschild radius in Schwarzschild coordinates. Yeah, so that's, that's what I thought. It shouldn't matter if it's a black hole. All that matters is that it's Schwarzschild outside of something, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, in principle, yeah. yes. Yeah, OK. So then my third question is the last one. Um, so suppose you have an object collapsing into a black hole. Is anything going to qualitatively change? So if you have Oppenheimer-Snyder collapse, it's always Schwarzschild outside it, but, but the actual size of the object decreases. So I could imagine, like I'm not quite sure, but I, I'm just wondering, once the threshold by which it's crossed its horizon hap takes place, I'm just wondering if something qualitatively different could happen. And I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I don't know either. So, I mean, that might be interesting to look at, right? Yeah. If something does, it's a way of a distant observer detecting collapse or something. But on the other hand, that's problematic. But I, I just, like on the one hand, Alice freely falling in would be like Alice on the edge of a star collapsing. Um, and so maybe it's not any different than that. But on the other hand, maybe it is once the thing has collapsed and you take into account the indirect. I'm not, I'm really not sure, but it seems I, I, I but maybe that's worth thinking about a bit. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Anyway, okay, thank you. So, so one maybe one comment, Rob. That, that it is uh, it is true that it's just bar sealed, right? But uh, the positioning of Alice and Bob in the different scenarios are certainly uh, places where uh, I hear it myself. Uh, maybe uh, I can. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, certainly, positioning in places where there would be no stable planets, right? I said like it has to be. A, if you want it to be physical, right, that would be a black hole. 
because um, you have a position in the valleys and bobbing radii where uh, there will be no st stable planet under them, right? They're like uh, either close to the photon radius, and uh, and then uh, also another scenario where Bob gets closer to the to the to the horizon, right? So in that sense, right, it's not a planet, even though it's true that it's just partial, right? Whatever is generating is partial there, but it's just the position that's that's uh, a bit extreme, as Robert mentioned. All right. Okay. Any, any, any more questions? All right. I don't see any more any more hands. In that case, okay. Let's thank uh, Robert again. Thank you for the great talk, Robert. It was pretty good. Thank you. All right. Let me stop. All right. Our next speaker is Matthew Robbins uh, from the University of Waterloo. And he's going to talk about entanglement amplification from rotating BDZ black holes. Matthew, floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Eduardo. As Eduardo said, I'll be talking about entanglement amplification around rotating BTZ black holes. And this work was done in collaboration with Laura Henderson and Rob Matt. So let me first place this work in the larger context. We know that the vacuum is naturally entangled in quantum field theory. We see this when dealing with black hole entropy, ADS, CFT correspondence, and quantum information. And in fact, these quantum correlations also show up when considering uh, the black hole information paradox and quantum energy teleportation. But interestingly, it's been realized that vacuum entanglement can actually be swapped with the physical system. So, the overarching question that I think everyone here wants to answer is, what is the entanglement structure of the quantum vacuum? So to hopefully uh, give some part of the answer to that question, let's consider specifically entanglement harvesting. This is where you have the transfer of entanglement between some sort of background quantum field and a pair of two level quantum systems, which we call unruh DeWitt detectors. And entanglement harvesting has been considered for many space times. I don't have a complete list on here, but we have entanglement harvesting in Minkowski space time, the sitter and anti sitter space time. And we recently, there's even been consideration of entanglement harvesting in black hole space times. And to give you a plug, for a couple other talks later today, Chen's going to be talking about unruh wet detectors differentiating between a black hole spacetime and a spacetime with an exotic compact object. Well, Ken is going to be talking about entanglement harvesting when you're freely falling into a black hole. So stay tuned for those talks. Now, the way that we model entanglement harvesting is through some simplified model of the like matter interaction. By this, I mean, this is the detector for our, this is the Hamiltonian for our, one of our unruh wet detectors. We see that it depends upon several different quantities. It depends upon the coupling constant between the scalar field and the detector. It will depend upon the switching function, which basically says, how long is your, going, how long is your detector going to be on and off? It will depend upon the proper time of your detector, the energy gaps of your detector, and because we're a two-level quantum system, it will depend upon the raising and the lowering operators. You will depend upon the scalar field itself and what the detector is doing within the spacetime. Is it freely falling? Basically, what is its trajectory? So let me give you an outline for what will be specifically talking about. We've seen, uh, I briefly reviewed what entanglement harvesting is, though now I'll go into a brief reminder about the entanglement harvesting protocol, and then talk to you about entanglement harvesting around BTZ black holes, give you some of the results that I hope you'll find interesting, and then give a few brief concluding remarks. Now, the key question that I'm going to try and answer is, how is entanglement harvesting affected by a black hole's angular momentum? So to 
Studying entanglement harvesting, we usually assume that our unruh weight detectors A and B are in a separable state with our scale of field. Well, we can do the standard unitary time evolution to determine what the final state of our system is, where we see that we have the detectors Ham Hamiltonians as part of our final state, HA and HB. Well, we can then determine what the state of detectors A and B are by tracing over the degrees of freedom of our quantum field. And we find that rho AB is going to be a two by two density matrix. This density matrix is going to depend upon the non-local correlations, the correlations between our detectors, as well as these quantities PA and PB, which describe uh, the transition probabilities between the ground state and the excited state of your detectors. Now, you notice that I'm only expanding up to order lambda squared. I'm assuming that we are working in the case that our coupling constant is small. Now, what we really want is to understand how entanglement is transferred from our scalar field to our detectors. And we can do this by using this quantity known as the concurrence, which is going to depend upon the non-local correlations as well as our detector transition probabilities. And the reason why we like the concurrence is because when the concurrence increases, that means that the amount of entanglement present within our detectors also increases. So let's look at the physical setup. We have some sort of black hole of mass M and we have two detectors A and B. Now, there's going to be some distance between the detector A and the black hole mass M, which I denote by this quantity D, and there will be some distance between detectors A and B. Now, for simplicity, we're going to assume that detectors A and B are kept at a constant distance, and all we do is move the entire quantity, uh, the entire detector system, um, closer to and away from the black hole, as we see on the screen. Now, for simplicity, we'll also assume that the switching function is going to be a Gaussian, where sigma describes basically the time scale of your switching function. We'll also take the energy gaps, omega a and omega b, to be the same, and we'll fix the ADS length to be some value. Now, we're also going to assume that we're working in the co-rotating frame, meaning that the detectors are going to be co-rotating with the black hole. Now, I will be specifically working with BTZ black holes. So the natural question is, well, why am I working with BTZ black holes? For starters, the metric is two plus one dimensional. We see that it's going to depend upon the mass of the detector as well as its angular momentum. And the mass and angular momentum of the detectors can be decomposed in terms of the inner and her outer horizon radii, as well as the ADS length. But the reason why we like BTZ black holes is because it's relatively straightforward to work with. The concurrence depends upon our transition probabilities and our non-locality, which in turn depend upon this quantity known as the Whiteman function. Now, the Whiteman function for a BTZ black hole is actually just the image sum of the ADS Whiteman functions, meaning that if you know the ADS Whiteman function, you know the BTZ Whiteman function exactly where gamma here describes maps phi to phi plus two pi and eta is going to refer to the twisting of the scalar field. For the sake of this talk, I'm going to assume that our scalar field is untwisted. So eta is just going to be taken to be one. Now, the parameter space is huge. I mean, I could investigate the mass of the black hole, its angular momentum, ADS length. I have a bunch of parameters I can investigate with the detector. I can also investigate the scalar field itself. And I could keep showing you plot after plot if I wanted to and go way beyond my time allotted. So in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on four parameters, the mass of the black hole, 
the angular momentum, the energy gaps of the detector, as well as the detector separation. And to remind you, the key question that I'm going to answer is how does the angular momentum of the black hole affect entanglement harvesting? To start, let's look at the concurrence for a large mass black hole where I'm defining large as basically m greater than or equal to one over 10. What we see is that for black holes, there will be some sort of uh, entanglement shadow where we don't have any concurrence. That is, we basically, we don't get any concurrence, meaning that the detectors can't be entangled with one another. This was previously found in uh, one of Laura's recent papers. And as we move the detectors farther away from the black hole, we see that the concurrence rises until it reaches some sort of maximum and then it plateaus. And this is the same regardless of whether we have a zero angular momentum black hole or something that's near extremal. And well, that tells us that at least for large mass black holes, angular momentum doesn't really do anything. But what happens if we switch to smaller mass black holes, where here I'll be working with m equals one over 1000. Well, you see that the situation drastically changes. As you increase the rotation, you see that the concurrence is going to become greater, greater rotation equals greater entanglement. And you see that far away from the black hole, we recover what we would see from ADS spacetime. It's going to be independent of, of the mass of the black hole and its angular momentum. So what I want to draw your attention to is if you're working with 0%, if you're working with a non-rotating black hole, or if you're working with something that's half of its extremal value, J equals 50%, you're not really going to be getting that much difference between the two curves. But as you begin increasing the angular momentum, you begin to see that there becomes more and more structure. At 95% and 99% extremality, you might think that, okay, maybe we're going to be getting some sort of plateau. But if you keep increasing the angular momentum, you find that you're going to keep increasing the concurrence such that you end up with this giant peak that's amplifying the concurrence at intermediate distances. However, what I want to underline is that this is only going to occur for small mass black holes. What happens if we decrease the energy gap? If we decrease the energy gap, we see that there's going to be very little difference between 0% and 50% uh, of the angular momentum again. But again, once we keep increasing the angular momentum to near extremality values, we see that there's still going to be a giant peak in the concurrence. And this occurs at intermediate distances, still at intermediate distances from the black hole. One might ask, well, what happens if we increase the distance of the two detectors? So far, we've kept the detector distances to be unity, but what happens if we just decide to increase it? Do we still find this amplification peak? And the answer is, well, yes, yes, we do. Here I'm plotting uh, the concurrence for near extremal values and changing the distances between the detectors. And we see that even if we increase the distance between the detectors by a factor of 10, we're still going to be getting some peak in the concurrence that's occurring at intermediate distances from the black hole. This raises the question of, well, why does this happen? And to answer this, let's break down the concurrence. The concurrence depends upon two quantities, the detector probability and the non-locality. If we focus on the detector probabilities, we find that if we increase the rotation, we're going to be getting greater 
in general, for most values of the angular momentum, we're going to be seeing that this will correspond to greater detection probabilities. But at intermediate regimes, this no longer holds. We're going to be actually getting a smaller detector probability when we're near extremality compared to say 99% or 95% of the angular momentum. And we still see that far away from the black hole, we recover ADS space time. We recover what we would expect for ADS. If we look at the non-localities, we find that again, the non-localities will correspond to greater non-locality corresponds to a greater angular momentum. We also see that by increasing the angular momentum, we're going to be increasing the, we're basically going to broaden the peak such that we almost end up with a plateau. But what about the image sum? I've showed you that we get this entanglement amplification, but you could ask, well, you're summing over the ADS Whiteman functions. How do you know that this is actually a black hole effect and not just some phenomena corresponding to ADS spacetime? To do this, we plotted how the concurrence changed by considering more and more terms in the image sum. If we just consider the n equals zero term in the image sum, this corresponds to ADS spacetime. Matthew, and, five minute warning. Excellent, sounds good, thanks. And we see that at the n equals zero case, we have just a plateau corresponding to ADS space time. As we increase the number of terms in our Whiteman function, we see that more and more terms corresponds to giving more and more structure such that eventually, if you increase, if you have say 100 terms in your writing function, or even just seven terms, or even just going from n equals minus seven to seven, you're going to see that, yes, there is in fact a peak that occurs. And this peak is only because these extra terms are the result of considering the BTZ Whiteman function rather than just the ADS Whiteman function. So to conclude, rotation causes amplification of the entanglement between the detectors. This is most pronounced for small mass black holes. And interestingly, really only shows up near extremality. If we stopped at 50% of the extremal value or even 90% of the extremal value, we wouldn't think that we'd be getting this amplification effect. So this raises a few questions. One, given that we can't actually uh, do a real life experiment, can we see this effect instead in analog gravity experiments? And to remind you, we've heard several presentations on analog related to analog gravity. In fact, we heard one just last week. Another question that can be asked is, what about other space times and other dimensions? I focused on two plus one dimensional space time, but what happens if we consider a real three plus one black hole? Or what happens if we just ignore black holes and focus on ADS or some other space time? I've mentioned that entanglement harvesting is extremely dependent upon the parameters of your space time and parameters of your detectors. So does this mean that maybe we can play around with the parameters in such a way that with the just the right set of parameters, we can also see some sort of amplification effect? But the most important question is, where does this effect come from? I've tried to answer this through, I've tried to answer this for you through the uh, looking at the image, some looking at the non-localities, looking at the detector probabilities, but this is only part of the question. Why 
this is only part of the answer. Why exactly does this amplification occur for near extremality? Why don't we really see anything even at 50% uh, of the extremal value? So uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, having me and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. All right, as uh, usual, we open uh, uh, the question time. Uh, use the raise hand feature of uh, Overleaf to ask questions, please. All right, I don't see any, any hands. Okay. Uh, Galaxy A10, that uh, uh, I'm going to intuit that this is uh, Mark, Mark Casals. Am I right? <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, <laughs> you are. Your intuition's good. <laughs> just my laptop just uh, just crashed, and I'm using my I'm using my cell phone. Um, just a quick question for Matthew. Do you understand where the peak and the concurrence? Do you understand where that happens? Is it possible to understand in terms of in geometrical terms, for example? That's uh, what we've been uh, thinking of, and we still don't really have a good intuition why it's specifically um, why it's specifically intermediate values. If I bring back the slides for the detector probabilities and the non-localities. It seems that it has something to do with how the uh, detector probabilities grow with respect to non-localities. We know that it's not really um, an ADS effect, partly because far from the black hole, we recover what we expect. Everything goes to its uh, goes to the same value, it asymptotes to what we expect. Close to the black hole, we'd expect that it would be some sort of redshift effect. So we think that redshift does have some sort of role to play in it, but that doesn't really answer the question of why it's occurring near extra, uh, why it's occurring at these intermediate distances and why it's really occurring for only really occurring for super near extremal black holes. So, so just, just to link, maybe I'm too naive, but just to link it to Robert, to the previous talk by Robert, um, could you link it to geodesics at all? I'm going to hazard a guess and say possibly, but that's not something that I've thought too much uh, in too much detail about. So I'm not confident to 100% uh, say that it's the rationale. Sure. OK. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Any, any more questions? OK. If there aren't any more questions, let's thank Matthew again. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Let me stop recording. Uh, the next speaker of the session is Cheng Zhang, and uh, he's going to talk about Android with detector differentiation of black holes and exotic compact objects. Cheng, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you all for organizing this and attending my talk. Uh, this talk is on how to use the Andrew David detector to differentiate black holes and exotic compact objects. Uh, I collaborated with Professor Bob Holderm and Professor Rob Mann on this work. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me start with one simple question. Can the black holes observed actually be exotic compact objects? Uh, we know that GR is not complete. It has the black hole information paradox. One solution can be that the black holes may actually be horizontally exotic compact objects. 
which has a similar compactness as black holes, but with no event horizon. Uh, here is the, the image of a black hole observed by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration in 2019. Uh, they already put some related remarks in their original paper saying that a shadow can be produced by any compact object with a space-time characterized by unstable circular photon orbits. And uh, ad they admit that uh, other compact object candidates need to be analyzed with more care. So the chance is still open. A conventional probe for the exotic compact object uh, is looking for gra gravitational wave e echoes in LIGO data. Uh, in this talk, we explore an alternative approach using root DeWitt detector. Uh, exotic compact, compact objects commonly have a reflecting surface uh, or in the other name membrane or ferrules uh, inside the gravitational, wave, uh, gravitational potential barrier forming a cavity structure. Uh, a wave falling inside the cavity get a reflex back uh, from the surface uh, and returns to the potential barrier after some time delay TD. Uh, the time delay equals to double of the cavity size uh, in total coordinate. So in the following talk, I will use the time delay uh, to denote uh, the cavity size. Uh, usually, we'll, uh, we put this reflecting surface uh, very close to the horizon. Uh, and the location of the reflecting surface, we denote uh, the location as R0. Uh, the probe of black holes using unroot DeWitt detector was started by this group of authors uh, here I, I review some basics and the, the, there are results that uh, will be useful for our later study of exotic compact objects. Uh, the interaction Hamiltonian is this, uh, where the lambda is the coupling strings between the field and the det detector. Uh, the chi here is the switching function of the detector. Uh, the mu here is the monopole operator. Uh, denoting the reading and the lowering between the two energy levels of the detector with energy gap omega. And the phi here, uh, the, the phi here is the field that uh, the energy the with the detector interact with. Uh, the x tau here is the trajectory of, of the detector. Uh, a useful quantity is the white man function, uh, which is simply the two point function of the scalar field. Uh, it is useful for calculating the responsibility uh, from this relation. Uh, if the switch function is a Harvey side step function, uh, which means that its switch on time is taken to be in the asthotic past, we can obtain the response rate by simply taking the derivative. Uh, in, uh, the response rate is relative to the Weidman function in this expression. Uh, the scalar field in spherical symmetric spacetime can be decomposed into radio and the spherical components. The equation motion for the radio mode can be written in this simple form in total coordinates. Uh, the function V denotes the gravitational potential barrier uh, whose peak is around 3m in normal coordinates. Uh, the differential equation for the radio mode has two plane wave solutions at the horizon and at the spatial infinity, uh, respectively, and uh, we call them E-mode and up-mode. As you can see from this uh, Perot's diagram, the E-mode is originated from the past now, uh, past now infinity, while the up-mode is uh, originated from the past even the horizon. Uh, in, the following uh, in the following discussion, we will use this normalized field modes for the in and up, where the T in and the T up are the transmission coefficients when they scatter with their gravitational potential. Uh, I will talk there more in the next slides. Uh, to solve the differential equation for the in and the up modes, we need to know their boundary conditions uh, in this black hole background. Uh, the expression, this expression represents the boundary condition for the in mode at the horizon and and the spatial infinity. 
uh, the meaning of the each term uh, can be interpreted by the figure by this figure. Uh, this is the gravitational uh, potential that uh, this wave scatter with. Uh, this is the impulling wave. After the, uh, after it gets scattered by the potential, some uh, is transmitted uh, with amplitude Tn, and some is reflected with amplitude Rn. Uh, for the up mode, this expression represents the boundary condition for the up mode at the horizon and at the spatial infinity. The meaning uh, of each term can be uh, illustrated similarly in this graph. Uh, this is all the going up mode wave that gets scattered with uh, <laughs> amplitude T up and the R up. To compute uh, this uh, uh, transmission and the reflection coefficients, we can match the drawn skins at the, uh, at the horizon and uh, at uh, the spatial infinity. Because we know drawn skins should be a constant over this uh, spatial coordinate, we arrive at these relations between relating this uh, uh, transmission and the re uh, reflection coefficient to the radar mode. So after we solve the radar mode, we can know the value of this uh, transmission and the reflection coefficient for in and up mode. Uh, from energy conservation, we know that the, the transmission coefficient square, uh, modulus square plus uh, reflection in coefficient the modulus square should equal to one. Uh, in the Bohr state, the quantum scalar field uh, can be expanded as this, uh, where the A here is the annihilation operator for this uh, U-mode basis. And this U-mode basis is related to the previous uh, uh, defined five fields. Uh, to get the response rate, we need to compute the Weidman function uh, and uh, from, uh, <coughs> then insert this into this expression for the response rate. We, one can uh, arrive at this simple expression. The heavy side step function uh, here vanishes for positive energy gaps. So we only need to study negative, negative energy gap, meaning that the response rate also, uh, actually represents the excitation, not the excitation. Uh, the the error sum we need to truncate them in uh, to up to error max. Where larger error larger than error max will give negligible contribution to this mode sum. The omega here. The omega tilde here is related to the energy gap of the detector uh, through this relation. Uh, with this, uh, with the, uh, the radar mode and the transmission coefficient calculated, the response rate can be directly obtained from this expression. Uh, the response rate for the Hawthorne Hawking state has similar expressions. We see the difference compared to the Bohr's data in this summer, summer factor, where T log is the local Hawking temperature. Uh, note that the energy gap over the Hawking temperature uh, equals, uh, is, is, is proportional to the uh, selected frequency omega tilde. So in the following, I, we will use this normalized, uh, normalized energy gap. Uh, interchangeably as a frequency. For unruh states, the expression is as follows. The, where the summer factor is only associated with the up modes. If we, if we take the ratio of the response rates between different vacuum states, we clearly see that they only differ at, only at the very small energy gaps. And the small difference is getting even smaller if you increase uh, their distance. Uh, this top line is for distance r equal to 4 m. The uh, bottom line is for r equal to 15 m. Uh, you can see the response rate, the, the difference between different vacuum for the response rate is uh, even smaller for a larger distance. So therefore, in the following, we focus on Bohr vacuum state. Uh, for 
Next, we study the unroot which detect the problem of exotic compact objects, uh, which has this foreign cavity structure with a layer of matter that may cause the damping of the wave. We associate uh, the reflecting surface and the, the matter uh, with an effective reflection factor RW. Uh, when, the, when, when the absolute value of this RW is smaller than one, this means some energy of the wave is transferred to the matter. When the RW equal to one or minus one, this, this corresponding to the Newman or Dirichlet boundary condition with no damping, which means they get perfectly reflected. Uh, as to the boundary conditions, note that there is no up mode in this exotic compact object space time since it has no even horizon. So only in mode can satisfy the exotic compact object boundary condition, which is follows. The term, oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the only new term compared to black hole case is this, uh, uh, is this term in red circle, uh, this corresponding to this reflected wave by this reflecting surface. To compute the, the transmission and the reflection coefficient, uh, to compute the transmission and the uh, reflection coefficient for this uh, ECO space time, uh, first, we need to derive the ECO boundary condition. This is obtained by matching this uh, by matching this formula at the spatial infinity. Uh, matching this formula and the derivative and the spatial infinity, we obtain these two relation. Uh, from this, we can compute the the value of T and R in, and uh, by matching the Roskins at the the horizon and the spatial infinity uh, at the reflecting surface and the spatial infinity we obtain this formula. Uh, when RW equal to zero, this is reduced to that uh, energy conservation formula. Uh, from this formula, we can tell that uh, for any RW, we always have a, re a reflection coefficient up to value smaller than one. Uh, this will be important in our later analysis. Uh, for the response rate uh, in this ECO space time, uh, we simply remove the up mode contribution from black hole formula. So we obtain this for the response rate. Once we get the, the rho in and the T in calculated, we can get the response rate directly from this formula. Uh, next, I present the results. Uh, the most distinctive feature in the uh, in the comparison of uh, uh, ECO to a black hole is this uh, resonance spectrum uh, of this uh, transmission function. Uh, for for illustrative purpose, we show this T in spectrum of a benchmark model with time delay around sixty six point five m in log ten basis. Uh, the red and the blue lines are. Uh, are the T in results with Newman and the Dirichlet boundary conditions. And the black line are for uh, RW equal to zero. Uh, as we can see from this uh, uh, graph, the specs, we, we observe a striking pattern of resonance specs for large RW. And these specs shift to a larger frequency or larger gaps uh, for our, if you increase the air modes. Uh, and we also see that there is uh, this resonance spikes disappeared for RW equal to zero. Uh, this uh, coincides with the black hole case. And uh, the largest spikes uh, appear for this uh, largest RW. Uh, five minute, five minute warning, Chen. Oh, okay, sorry. I will speed up. Uh, and uh, the, these spikes are evenly spacing. And uh, this uh, graph, is, uh, here we show the teen spectrum of our ACO with a larger time delay uh, than the Y in previous slides. We see that the spacing between the specs get smaller and this is related from the formula for, uh, for this spacing here. 
from this formula, we can tell that uh, the spacing is the inverse proportional to the time delay of the cavity. Yeah. Uh, for the next, we present the results for the response rate of our static uh, UDW detector outside the, uh, the ECO. Uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, the table graphs denote the numerical result for the response rate versus normalized gap for different uh, UCO time delays and the different distance of the data. Uh, the time delays increase from left to right graphs uh, and, uh, the, uh, dis and the distance goes larger from top to bottom graphs. Uh, in each graph, the, right, the, the, the red lines uh, denotes the new my boundary condition, blue line denotes directly the boundary condition, and the black line is for RW equal to zero, while the orange line is for the normal black hole case. Oh, sorry. Uh, from the first row, we can see that the, uh, the striking redundance pattern matches that of the TN. The location of each redundance spike is independent of distance. And uh, the locations, uh, sorry, and the, the uh, larger de time delays will have or will have their, uh, will have uh, this uh, redundance peaks distribution more dense. Uh, vice versa. And uh, compared to the uh, those of second and third rows, we see that uh, as their distance get larger, the the redundance is become suppressed in size. Uh, we will give our uh, surprise insights. Compared to the black and the orange line in the second row, we can clearly see that uh, even, even our perfect absorbing ECO has a lower uh, detailed response rate than black hole. Uh, you can see here this black line is for the ECO with RW equal to zero, and this orange line is for the black hole case. We see the black line is lower than the orange line. Yeah. This is due to the fact that the, the ECO has no up mode contribution. Uh, in the last row, we can see that uh, the large R, uh, we, in the last row, we can see that in the large R limit, all the response rates approach to the Minkowski uh, vacuum limit. Uh, yes, due to short of time, I may skip this. Uh, is uh, discuss why this uh, we get uh, our redundance size surprised at a large distance. It basically is because at the small distance, when we take uh, the limit, take uh, the absolute uh, uh, modulus of the boundary condition, we know that uh, at the small distance, the result is proportional to this transfer function, which is unbound. But at the large distance, the result is uh, constrained into this finite window. This is the reason why the renounces are surprised at the large distance. Uh, and the other reason is related to this error mode sum. Uh, I think I don't have time for this. Uh, but the, from this reasoning, we know that we can increase the cavity size to, uh, to have these spikes survived at the large distance. As you can see from these graphs, uh, this this graph is for this uh, distance is equal to 150 m, which is a very large distance. Uh, and uh, by increasing the cavity size to 60, 600 m, we can still identify clear resonance structure at a small uh, small gap region. So, some in summary, uh, due to the absence of an event horizon and the corresponding up modes in the vacuum field, a perfectly absorbing ECO with RW equal to zero space time has a smaller detailed response rate than that of same mass black holes. The cavity between an ECO's reflective boundary and the gravitational potential peak determines the time delay TD and the results in distinct resonance structures connected to the poles of the transfer function T in. Our large cavity size can increase the chance of also absorbing a renal structure at a large distance. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm open to any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. We open the question time now. As usual, use the raise hand feature.
I don't see any hands, but I'm going to leave uh, 30 more seconds. Sometimes it takes a while. All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, let's thank Chen again. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Right, the next speaker is Kensuke Gallo Yoshimura, and uh, he is uh, going to talk about endowment harvesting or harvesting entanglement with detectors freely falling into a black hole. So, Ken, the uh, floor is yours whenever you want. Thank you. Uh... Uh, thanks for inviting me to my, uh, this conference. Uh, I'm Ken Gallak from University of Waterloo. And uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, harvesting entanglement with detectors free falling into a black hole. And this work was done by me, Erickson Joa, and Robert Mann. And here is the archive number. And so you can go check that. Okay, so uh, so to begin with, um, let us talk about this uh, motivation here. So what is entanglement harvesting? Uh, entanglement harvesting is the protocol to extract entanglement from quantum fields using, using multiple unruh uh, detectors. And so here I have two UDW detectors and initially in a separable state and they interact with the local quantum field and eventually becomes a entangled state, okay? So uh, this, the amount of entanglement is sensitive to uh, some aspects of detectors motion or like space-time properties. For example, the space-time dimension, uh, its curvature, topology, or boundary conditions. Okay. So if you have a UDW detector and extract the entanglement, you can notice the difference between, well, different curve space times. So in particular, we are interested in harvesting in a black hole space-time. Uh, and there are some papers on it. Uh, first was about BTZ black hole and Erickson and Rob did for two dimensional short shield and Vija space times. And also as Matthew already talked about, um, he did for rotating BTZ black hole. And these paper um, mainly consider the static detectors um, hovering outside of the uh, black hole. So if you have two detectors here, uh, both detectors are staying at some region outside of a event horizon. Now, the common thing that they show is so-called entanglement shadow. So basically this is if you plot uh, the amount of extracted entanglement as a function of uh, detector's position, then uh, near the event horizon, there, there is a region where you cannot harvest entanglement at all. And this is called the region of entanglement shadow. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, um, entanglement harvesting is sensitive to detector's motion. So it is natural to ask um, what happens if we choose not static detectors, but um, moving detectors. So in this project, we will use uh, freely falling detectors in two-dimensional short field space-time. And in our paper, we have shown uh, three things. One is a, about kin kinematical effects such as relative velocity and acceleration. Uh, basically, it says um, if you have free falling detector and static detector, uh, the, this kinematical effect will dilute uh, entanglement because of the Doppler redshift. And second thing is that um, if you have uh, free falling detector, inside of a black hole, then 
uh, even when two detectors are causally disconnected by event horizon, uh, you can still harvest correlation. And also we have shown that um, if we choose to have two free falling detectors, then uh, there is no entanglement shadow in that case. Okay. So in this talk, I will um, show you these last two results. And so to begin, to begin with, um, I want to just briefly review uh, the trajectory of infolding part uh, detector and some aspects of uh, UDW detector. So first of all, uh, short shield space time. Uh, this is a maximally um, spherical symmetric static uh, space time. And usually when we learn about this by using textbooks, they introduce so-called short shield metric, which is divergent at the event horizon. So instead, what we usually do is to uh, change the coordinate system so that um, it is no longer divergent at the event horizon. And one of the examples is this Panluve Gurstrand coordinate system, uh, which gives uh, this kind of metric. And uh, this Panluve Gurstrand coordinate system is based on uh, free falling detectors or free falling observers' uh, proper time. So in this project, whenever we consider uh, like time like, uh, sorry, space like hypersurface or something, we always use uh, this coordinate system. Okay. And also, we are using one plus one dimensional space time. So we will uh, get rid of this two sphere part. Okay. Now, uh, also, I want to mention some uh, trajectories of detectors. Uh, mainly, we consider three trajectories um, or three cases. One is that uh, two detectors at fixed radius. And the other thing is one detector is static and one goes into the black hole. And finally, two detectors fall uh, from the uh, infinity to into the black hole. Now, uh, by the way, this red and blue lines indicate um, the interaction duration of the detectors. And uh, in our case, these free falling detectors uh, fall from the infinity without initial velocity. Okay. So uh, that was about short shield space time. And now let's move on to uh, UDW detector and some settings. So uh, we have two things. One is detector and it is interacting with the local quantum field. Okay? So detector and quantum field. So uh, first of all, we use a identical point like detectors with Gaussian switching. And uh, for a quantum field, we use massless scalar field in one plus one dimensional short shield space time. And in particular, we choose uh, either Umru vacuum or Hartle-Hawking vacuum. And detectors and quantum field interact with each other. Uh, and this is the interaction Hamiltonian. So here, the left part is the detector part and right part is the quantum field. So lambda j is the coupling strings uh, of detector A or between detector J and uh, quantum field. And chi of tau is the switching function as a function of the proper time of detector J. And we are using Gaussian switching. So uh, explicitly, it looks like this one, where sigma is the duration of the Gaussian. And this mu hat is the monopole operator given by this formula. So this is the dynamics of a two-level quantum system 
and omega is the energy gap of the detector. Okay. And this detector is coupled to a local quantum field, but with a derivative with respect to detectors proper time. And this is called the derivative coupling. And by doing so, we can, um, we can get rid of so-called IR ambiguity in two-dimensional masses scalar field. So, and um, this is a bit technical, but um, we are going to do numerical calculations. So uh, to simplify the calculation, we use um, Gaussian switching, but cut off uh, like at minus five sigma and five sigma. Okay. Now, by using this uh, setups, uh, we can now move on to perturbation theory. So here uh, we assume that initially uh, two detectors are in ground states and a quantum field is in a vacuum state, either Unruh vacuum or hartle hawking vacuum. And the uh, time evolution operator is given by this thing. So now we can do the perturbation theory and obtain the density matrix of detectors A and B. And uh, it is given by this four by four matrix where M given by this one is so-called non-local term. And uh, it is important to focus on LAA and LBB, uh, which is uh, transient probability or uh, local noise term. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, this A is the Weinmann function. So uh, we are going to uh, look at these guys. And so in entang entanglement harvesting, uh, we want to look at the entanglement between two detectors, A and B. So to measure the entanglement, we will use so-called concurrence given by this formula. And uh, this is basically the uh, non-local term minus the local noise term, okay? So if the concurrence is zero, it means there is no entanglement. Um, so you cannot harvest or extract the entanglement from the vacuum. Otherwise, if the non-local term is greater than uh, local noise, then uh, you, you can get uh, entanglement between detectors A and B. And so in that sense, this non-local term is uh, important for entanglement and the noise term is, well, it's noise. Okay, so um, let's move on to some uh, results. So uh, I want to show you uh, mainly two results. One is when we have free folding detectors and um, static detector. And we want to show that even if they are causally disconnected by event horizon, uh, you can always uh, um, extract correlation from the vacuum. And other result is that when you have two free foreign detectors, um, there is no uh, previously known um, entanglement shadow near the event horizon, right? So let's look at this free fall and static detector case. So here is the Penrose diagram. Um, this 45 degree line is uh, event horizon and Alice or detector A uh, free falls from infinity and goes through the event horizon. And detector B or Bob uh, tries to stay out um, and he is in a static motion. Okay. Now, um, what we want to look at is the case where two detectors cannot 
signal at all. So obviously Alice cannot signal to Bob or Bob cannot uh, receive the signal from Alice, but Alice can receive the signal from Bob. Okay? When he turns on his detector around this orange lines here. So orange lines are basically a uh, propagation of signal and uh, it is, well, note that in mass, well, massive scalar field in one plus one dimensional space time with derivative coupling, um, you can signal at the, uh, uh, in the 45 degrees line, okay? So, and, uh, five minute warning. All right, thanks. So, yeah. So by making sure that they are causally disconnected and cannot signal at all, we have this uh, figure. Um, this I thing is the mutual information. This is basically correlation, um, including classical and quantum, and C is the concurrence. So this is entanglement. Now you can see that we can harvest correlation, classical and quantum, but it seems that you cannot harvest entanglement, although uh, this is unfortunately, we couldn't do it for uh, numerical calculation, um, but there's evidence that you can harvest entanglement because this event horizon is not special place. You can, you, if you choose a vacuum or hartle hawking vacuum, quantum field is uh, defined smoothly here. And also it, is, it has shown that um, two detectors can harvest entanglement, even if they are very far away, if you have large omega or energy gap. So, but by doing so, uh, we break the, we, we will break, um, the code will break, so we can show this, but at least you can harvest correlation in this case. Okay? Now, finally, I want to show you uh, the free, two free foreign detector case. Um, so previously, there uh, there was for two static detector case, there was a entanglement uh, shadow region, and we want to show that for free falling detectors case, uh, there is no entanglement shadow here. So we assume that two detectors are um, free falling from the same point and they are always at the same location, but their uh, the interaction timings are different. So in this case, Bob turns his detector on earlier and Alice turns, on, their, turns her detector on later on. And um, here I have M equals 50. So mass of the black hole is 50. So that event horizon at 2M is 100. And um, blue line is the concurrence. Okay? So you can see that the concurrence uh, grows uh, before entering the black hole. By the way, D of RA0 is the proper distance between singularity and Alice Gaussian peak. So before she enters the black hole, detectors can harvest entanglement. And as they uh, reach the singularity, the amount of entanglement becomes more larger. So first thing we notice is that uh, there is no entanglement shadow. Uh, they can harvest entanglement across the event horizon, but also uh, you will notice that entanglement is increasing as they reach to reach the singularity. And this is because um, it is assisted by communication. So there are two ways to um, entangle two detectors. One is by exchange of quanta, meaning uh, if in this case, if they are in light like separation, the massive scalar field propagates and detectors can exchange the quanta so that they become entangled. Okay? But uh, in harvesting protocol, it is important to look at uh, this one, which is uh, using pre-existing 
entanglement in the field. So in this case, you don't have to signal um, to other detector. You only need to use the pre-existing entanglement in the quantum field. So, um, so you can harvest entanglement even if two detectors are causally disconnected. Okay? So uh, to show this, we have this so-called signaling estimator, meaning if signaling estimator is zero, two detectors cannot harvest, uh, cannot signal. But if it's non-zero, they can signal. Okay? Now, near the singularity, the trajectory of free-falling detector is almost light-like. So Bob can send signal to Alice. And by doing so, they can exchange the quanta and make more entanglement. So that's what's happening near the singularity. Okay. So in summary, we have uh, looked at two things. One is free fall and static case, and the other is two free falling detector case. Uh, for free falling and static detector case, two detectors can harvest entanglement even when they are causally disconnected by event horizon. And uh, for two free folding detector case, there is no entanglement shadow near the event horizon. And also they can, well, be correlated more near singularity because they can communicate. Okay, so that's all. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much, Ken. So we open the floor for questions now. As usual, please use the raise hand feature. Okay, Jorma, please. Uh, yep, go ahead. Very nice, thank you. So um, I'd like to ask a question about the scenario where you can harvest entanglement with one person in the black hole and the other outside. Right. How would the two ever know that they have harvested entanglement? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's one of the problem with, with um, free forwarding detectors because once you cross the event horizon, then how do you, you know, get out the uh, detector from the event horizon? So yeah, that's the one of the problem. Um, and yeah, so there's, so I was thinking about this and well, obviously not for short shield space time. So, but I'm not sure it, um, what happens to, for example, regular black holes or I don't know. But um, yeah, so unfortunately in this case, uh, they can not know they are in entangled state or maybe use the detectors as a, like a quantum information processing or something. But, well, at least, at least, like, um, we can show that entang uh, they can entangled across the event horizon and there's no, like, uh, well, in two, three, four in detector case, it's much worse than uh, this guy, but um, in two, three, uh, three, four detector case, you can show, like, previous known the property of the black hole harvesting like uh, there is no uh, entanglement shadow there so maybe this project is just to show those properties but in on the like practical grounds uh, as you might like there's um, it's not so useful. <laughs> Right, so yeah, that's the that's a great point, but um, yeah, I was wondering what you know what happens if I don't know, assuming detector is not destroyed, uh, like for regular black holes, and after black hole evaporated, and <laughs> I don't know, but uh, 
Yeah, but at least in this case, Schwarzschild's uh, case, uh, yeah, it's not for practical use. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jorma. Uh, next question comes from the Galaxy A10. That's uh, Marcus Alts. Uh, hi, Ken. Uh, nice talk. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, so mm -hmm. does it diverge at the, at, the, at the singularity? Which one? Does it actually diverge at the singularity or is it just a local okay, maximum? Okay. Yeah, so um, we avoided to look at when the detectors, I mean, um, when detector hits the singularity, we avoided that because we, I mean, at least I didn't know um, what to do with it, okay? Like, so all the calculation here um, assumes that the detector switching turns off right before the it hits the singularity. So right. yeah, that's what's happening here. Okay, so, so I'm just wondering, it looks like whether, whether it diverges or not, it is driving up, certainly driving up the, the, uh, in the harvesting. So I was just wondering what would happen in the case that there is no, I'm thinking about the two dimensional riser Nordstrom, Nordstrom space time, yeah. where there is no actual curvature singularity and there's a Cauchy horizon instead. Mm -hmm. um, would it still be, you know, would it, would it peak around the Cauchy horizon or what? I'm not sure. I was looking at the response function of the, like a Cauchy, at the Cauchy horizon, someone did, but um, yeah, I'm not sure about entanglement harvesting. To be honest, I'm not sure about the QFD in Ryzen and Nordstrom's uh, space time. So I don't have a good intuition about it. Um, yeah, but that would be interesting to look at. So, yeah, I'm not sure that's the answer. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I know that Birrell and Davis, I think in the 70s, had a paper where they looked at the quantum instability of the Cauchy, of the Cauchy mm -hmm. horizon in two, in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, it's been useful as a time model for, for four okay. dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, nice talk. Ken. All right, thank you, Mark. Any other questions? Well, if there aren't any more questions, let's thank Ken again. Thank you for the talk, Ken. Nice. And please, let's thank all the speakers today. Thank you very much for all the good talks. Thank you very much. Uh, now, let's remember uh, that uh, next week, there's another session at the same time. And uh, again, that this session will be uh, uploaded as usual. Uh, on the playlist that you already have uh, the link to and appears in every reminder every week. Anyways, thank you very much for coming and I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.